The Dance Edit podcast is brought to you by Jackrabbit Dance. Jackrabbit is the industry's most reliable dance studio management software. If you're a studio owner, you know how important class management software is. Jackrabbit is going to make your life so much easier. Their software is cloud-based, powerful, and adaptable. And Jackrabbit has the industry's largest team of trainers, product coaches, and client success specialists to support you in your studio. You wouldn't accept less than the best from your students. Don't accept it from your software either. Visit jackrabbitdance.com and use the promo code DANCEMEDIA, all one word, for a free trial. Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Lydia Murray. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about the Theatrical Stage Union's new 27-page set of safety guidelines for the reopening of live performance venues, and what some recent guinea pig performances have actually looked like, discussing the emotional toll that COVID-19 has taken on performers, And how for the dance community especially, there's actually more hope to be found in waiting than there is in rushing to return to the stage. Highlighting the Black Theater Coalition, which is a new organization that's advocating for a huge increase in Black employment in the theater industry. And hearing from Denise Saunders Thompson, the president and CEO of the International Association of Blacks in Dance. Um, We're really excited for you all to hear Denise's voice memo. She and all of IABD have been on the front lines of the fight against systemic racism for decades, and her perspective is invaluable when it comes to contextualizing the news stories that we're discussing each week. You, You might have noticed that we've started featuring not just dancers, but also other dance world creatives and administrators in our voice memo series, and that's very much intentional. Um, We want to amplify a diversity of voices and present a diversity of perspectives on the issues that are important to the dance community as a whole, not just to dancers. Um, So if there's someone that you'd like to hear from, or if you yourself are a leader who would like to send a memo, please let us know. Um, Send us a message on Instagram at the.dance.edit or on Twitter at dance underscore edit, or you can email me directly at mfuhrer, F as in Frank, U-H-R-E-R, at dancemedia.com. Okay, so now let's get started with our usual dance headline rundown, um, because there was a lot of news of note this past week that we don't want to ignore. So Courtney, can you start us off? Sure thing. So a whole slew of Hamilton alums are coming together for a trio of live stream fundraisers called Hashtag Ham for Change, which will benefit a number of different social justice organizations. The first is happening this Saturday at 1. This year's Emmy nominations for Outstanding Choreography are here. The nominees are Al Blackstone, Travis Wall, Jamel McWilliams, Jefferson Benhumea, and Adrianita Avila, and Paris Goebel. Uh, Former Ailey School students have gone public with further allegations against former Ailey 2 Artistic Director Troy Powell. Powell, of course, was dismissed from the organization last week after an independent investigation found that he engaged in inappropriate communications with adults enrolled at the school. But these dancers allege that his behavior went beyond that uh, and just want to caution everyone listening if this might be triggering content for you to take care before seeking it out. The Broadway Community Project has launched. The project aims to illustrate the scope of COVID-19's impact on the Broadway community by creating essentially a family tree of Broadway workers to help secure funding. It outlines the different kinds of Broadway employees, including those who typically go unrecognized, like house managers and insurance brokers, just to name two examples. Sacramento Ballet announced both the cancellation of its 2020-2021 live performance season and the departure of artistic director Amy Seward, who has only been at the helm since 2018. From the sounds of it, the company's financial picture in the face of all that lost revenue was too bleak for them to afford to keep her on. They're looking to return to the stage in winter 2021, and in the meantime are continuing to offer virtual content. The film adaptation of the Tony-nominated musical The Prom has resumed production. The Prom is only the second major Netflix project to start again, so it'll serve as a COVID-19 safety regulation test for the company. Uh, On a similar note, Dancing with the Stars is eyeing September for a production start date. Uh, The exact timing remains fluid as ABC and BBC Studios are still in the process of working out health and safety regulations and getting them approved by the appropriate unions and guilds. 
And the Kennedy Center is hoping to get back on stage in January with a series of hour-long performances. The twist? The audience will be seated on stage in pairs while the artists perform on a stage extension built into the front of the orchestra-level seating. To avoid crowding, audience members will enter through wide loading doors on the center's front plaza, and this will go into effect only when Washington, D.C. enters the third phase of its reopening plan. So we're in the strange phase now where we still have some cancellation headlines, but we're also starting to get more news about in-person dance projects actually starting up again, which leads us into our next segment, um, in which, first of all, we want to talk about the extensive safety guidelines that the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees released last week, laying out how live performance venues might protect their workers when they reopen. And when we say extensive guidelines, we do mean extensive. This document which was reviewed by medical experts in occupational health and safety, is 27 pages long. It discusses both bigger picture suggestions and more specific practice recommendations to keep everyone from cast members to ticket sellers to wardrobe supervisors healthy. So summarizing this is basically impossible because 27 pages, uh, but some highlights. Uh, no more stage door meetings or backstage tours. Um, it also puts the onus on venues to provide PPE and have extensive plans in place. Uh, and, you know, for multi-employer venues to collaborate and coordinate their plans so everyone is on the same page. Uh, it all needs to be approved by local health officials. Um, it also calls for making sure paid sick leave and income protection are in place. I cannot believe that is still something we have to negotiate for stage workers, but I'm glad that it is being recommended at least. For sure. Retweet. Well, and I think also I was really heartened to hear the like specifically like if there are multiple employers in a single venue, you need to coordinate because this mm -hmm. is something that I've been talking about just in my personal life with my friends is making sure like even if we're doing socially distanced meetups, like being really clear about like this is who I've seen in the last two weeks. This mm -hmm. is what my personal practices are. So I think that scaling that bigger is really important for everyone going forward, regardless of yeah. what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, and over the past week or so, there have been a few live shows um, in Europe that have tested out some of the practices recommended in this IATSC document, it's just giving us a sense of what the new theatrical landscape might feel like. Um, the first West End performance since March was staged on July 23rd. It was a one-off show at the London Palladium, spearheaded by Andrew Lloyd Webber um, and starring musical icon Beverly Knight. And then last Wednesday in Granada, Compania Nacional de Danza, which is now headed by Joaquin Deleuze, um, staged an outdoor performance as part of an annual festival. And then beginning this weekend, um, Katzbahn is going to kick off an outdoor dance festival at its compound in upstate New York. So some things happening in America as well. In the West End show, um, only 640 of the venue's 2,000 seats were used in order to uh, adhere to social distancing requirements. And in Granada, um, Joaquin Delu started planning the company's return to the studio in mid-April. And by the second week of May, he and the company's executive director had outlined a really robust set of COVID safety guidelines for everything from daily class to partnering, rehearsals, dressing rooms, and performance. Um, just really stringent guidelines. But in mid-July, the dancers were all tested and the results were negative. So they were able to touch without wearing masks at that point. And then we're, we're all curious too to see how things go at Katzban, um, because their festival is going to run from August 1st through September 27th. It's actually kind of a lot of programming um, happening on an outdoor stage built in the middle of a field on its compound in upstate New York. Which they have so much space up there. So like this is kind of the ideal place to try out the sort of distanced open air performance. The most socially distancing friendly dance location. Yeah. It sounds, frankly, it's really exciting to hear that this is even happening somewhere in the United States. But there was a New York Times piece about it. And the final quote was from... Jamar Roberts, who he's contributed drawings for a light and sound installation that's going to be displayed during the festival. He said, generally, I'm a hopeful person, but at this moment, I just don't know how I feel. If you allow yourself to really take in what's happening, it's all sad, all of it, in every way, which is also true. Like, we, we can allow ourselves to be excited that things are starting to happen, but at the same time, even as we see these first tentative steps back into live performance, we have to be aware of the profound emotional ways that COVID has affected the dance world. Um, so in our next segment, we want to talk about the fact that, first of all, many dancers and dance enthusiasts now have a deep-seated and rational 
fear of theater spaces, and that the pandemic has instilled other fears, too, fears that aren't going to go away anytime soon. Sanjay Savaramutu from Louisville Ballet recently wrote a blog post titled, I'm Scared of Going Back, uh, where he outlines his fears for returning to the studio and the traditional dance setting. Um, it was so poignant. One thing that I wanted to touch on is uh, just the shared emotional vulnerability of this time and how so many of us are expressing it. It's, I think, rare in such a competitive, competitive field, um, especially one that so often relies heavily on curation and kind of facades. And as we go through this traumatic, uncertain time together, we almost can't help but talk about it and reveal ourselves to each other in this uncommon way. Um, well, and I think that also as dancers, and this is something I know I've been feeling and I've been hearing from a lot of my dancer friends, is missing that sense of walking into the studio and just throwing your arms around someone, missing that yeah. physical contact. But at the same time now, there's this feeling of second guessing wanting to do that because it right. has taken on this whole dimension of being kind of a scary thing to even contemplate doing. And... Yeah, like I think it's going to be interesting to see how we navigate this as people who inherently relate to the world and to each other in a very physical way. Yeah, it almost reminds me of coming back from an injury and mm -hmm. having that, you know, that sense of constantly second guessing whether you're taking the right precautions or, you know, whether you're going to get hurt or something like that. This Sanjay's post, his piece, which is, yeah, it's essentially a, a poem is essential reading. We'll link to it in the episode description. Please go read it. Maybe have tissues nearby. Not a bad idea. Um, artists and, and audiences too will need some time to address and process all of these fears and feelings, you know, as laid out in Sanjay's post. Um, and Gia Corliss wrote a piece for the New York Times this week, kind of wondering aloud whether for dancers, the show shouldn't go on, or at least not for a while. Um, she was very candid about the fact that for the dance community and, and frankly, most of the performing arts world, patience is key, that a push to reopen sooner just doesn't make a lot of sense um, for these art forms. And then the piece looked for ways to find hope as we're waiting. Yeah, and she seemed to be basically saying coronavirus cases are increasing in the U.S. with no clear guidance from the federal government about how best to handle that. Most dancers' jobs are at least somewhat dangerous under those circumstances. You know, dancers touch and share small spaces and breathe near each other. Uh, she also mentioned how in the NBA, the measure they took to curb infections was to isolate players together on a compound in Florida, which was effective, but of course... Dance companies don't have nearly as much money as top sports teams do. Um, she also made what I thought was an important point about wanting to see meaningful dance work created specifically to be seen digitally. Um, she mentioned the kind of dancing she wants to see as um, originating in the body and taking charge in deeper ways as if the camera isn't there um, or dancing on a cellular level. I, yeah, I think it's when she was saying art, digital art that feels designed for that medium rather than simply made digitally because it can't live anywhere else right now. And I think one of the most successful examples of that that we've seen come out of quarantine is the piece that Kyle Abraham made on his ballet muse, Taylor Stanley, um, Se Nom Que Nous Portons, mm -hmm. which it was performed in front of the Lincoln Center fountain when all of Lincoln Center was lit up with the colors of the pride flag back in June. It resonates on a certain frequency that a lot of the other digital content right now doesn't well and i think it's definitely been really cool to see uh you know dance makers finding their way in a digital medium but i think it's also very useful to look at the dance artists and innovators who have been doing that work uh who have kind of already made all of the like silly mistakes one might make and see like okay what are what are the things that they do that make them particularly successful and what have they figured out i think this is, can be a huge learning moment for everyone in the dance community so speaking of of things to be hopeful about during this prolonged shutdown one of them is that the time away from the stage is allowing performing arts leaders to really think about the deeper problems in their industries and how we might begin to fix them um, in our next segment, we want to discuss the Black Theater Coalition, which is a brand new organization created by Broadway actor T.L. Ever Reed, Broadway choreographer Warren Adams, and philanthropist Reggie Van Lee, with the goal of increasing the number of Black professionals working on Broadway 500% by 2030. And it's already on its way to that goal. 
One great initiative from this is that the revival of company on Broadway will hire 10 black paid interns in every department of the production, and they'll be getting practical training. I think this is really a step in the right direction. Key because thing, paid th- internships. Yes, Huge. yes. Absolutely. Um, as we've already you know, discussed in previous episodes, especially about the ballet world, access to high quality entry level opportunities is critical to long term diversity. If the best way to have a successful career on Broadway is to start as an unpaid or barely paid intern, that creates a major barrier for a lot of BIPOC offstage talent who could do great work. Um, and similar organizations have been formed recently that are also making headway like Black Theatre United, which was recently formed by Audra McDonald and 21 other incredibly influential black figures in theater. Um, McDonald recently said in an interview with Broadway.com, she spoke about the power of representation and wanting to create an army of amplifiers, which of course matters too, because it's difficult to be what you can't see. And another group that's doing great work is We See You at American Theater, which published a list of demands for change that's now a 31-page document addressing cultural competency, hiring practices, uh, compensation, and a host of other areas for improvement. Um, And it was kind of described in an American Theater article as an anti-racism manual on workplace safety, which describes it so well. Yeah, I've seen so many tweets to the effect of like, okay, guys, theater's on pause. There's no excuse. You have the time. Do the work now. Exactly. Yep. Speaking again of people doing the work, now we have the next installment in our voice memo series. This week, we have a message from Denise Saunders Thompson, the president and CEO of the International Association of Blacks and Dance. She is also president and CEO of the fine arts advisory firm D.D. Saunders and Associates, Inc., and a board of trustees member for Dance USA. She has worked extensively across the performing arts world in both nonprofit and for-profit organizations for decades. She's an advocate. She is an educator. She is a singularly important voice in the dance community. Here she is. Greetings, Dance Edit listeners. I am Denise Saunders Thompson, President and CEO of the International Association of Blacks and Dance. Currently, I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is right outside of our nation's capital, Washington, DC. And life at home is with my husband, my son, and our dog, Pepper. IABD, the International Association of Blacks and Dance, has been on the front line of fighting systemic racism going on three decades. The organization turns 30 in 2021. And through our mission of preserving and promoting dance of African ancestry and origin, as well as providing opportunities in advocacy, education, funding, performances, touring, and other areas. We have been the voice for Black, Brown, and people of the global majority for many, many, many years. We continue to lift up, we continue to tell our stories, and we continue to raise awareness around the systemic inequities that have plagued our community for decades. I have, IBD has always been a truth teller, a keeper of history for Blacks in dance, and has never been silent about the challenges that dance artists and companies have faced, but yet continue to find the strength to carry on despite all of the odds being stacked against them. Currently, IBD has launched the I Said, Can You Hear Me Now? campaign, which is in three phases. The first phase is a letter to the white American dance community. The second phase is the Black Report, which was a release of a financial and organizational assessment of a representative sample of 30 Black-led dance companies from throughout the United States. And phase three is TBA. To be announced, we'll be letting you know what it is quite soon. But really, setting off this rather organic campaign was a letter entitled, Let's Take a Moment. And this letter was in response to the murder of George Floyd and the appearance of our organization's silence. 
While many of my colleagues were in the field putting out solidarity statements, IBD was intentionally silent. We were listening, we were watching. We wrote the letter to reassure our community that IBD wasn't going anywhere, that we would still be in service, but we would be working more intentionally and with meaning. The staff made conscious decisions about everything, who we would engage with, how we would engage with people, our response times, the content for engagement, our social media posts, email, everything, everything was on the table for reconsideration. And we told our community that IBD would fight for them and that they should also fight for themselves and call for change. So after the moment letter, IBD watched closely members of the industry to see how they would respond to these three crises that were occurring. Of course, the health crises with COVID-19, the economic crises that continues to this day because people are not working. Our industry has been put on stop. And the racial racial crises, of course, with the murder of George Floyd. And so as my colleagues presented their statements, IBD took note. We saw who made a statement, who didn't make a statement, what was the content of the statement, all that wasn't said from those dance companies and institutions in the field. All of that made me write the letter and that feeling needed to come out. And so Dear White American Dance Community said all the things that it needed to say. As part of phase two of our I Said Can You Hear Me Now campaign is the recently released Black Report. It's an organizational and financial assessment of 30 Black-led organizations from across the United States. And a few years ago, IBD had the opportunity to travel to 16 states to visit these organizations, along with their staff, their board, members of the community and volunteers, stakeholders, to discuss not only the financial aspects of the company, but the organizational health of the company as well. The Black Report is a historical document because it is the first time ever, and I'll say that again, it is the first time ever that a report has been developed solely on Black dance companies. No comparisons, no apples and oranges and grapes and tomatoes, strictly on Black dance companies. And in addition, it's a research tool and a historical historical tool that includes the many, many, many contributions of Blacks in dance. So for all of my academicians out there and my historians and scholars, download the report. It can be accessed through our website because you can add it to your curriculum. Phase three of our campaign is soon to be announced, but you'll be hearing about that soon in just a few weeks. The letter, though, has shifted the dialogue around race and centering Blackness in our conversations, and I believe provided my colleagues with the opportunity to be more reflective and intentional about the much-needed steps they will be taking both personally and professionally moving forward in support of Black lives. We have all witnessed Black people losing their lives every day just because of the color of their skin. And if you're not able to recognize this and or if you make a decision uh, to constantly not be a part of change, then racism will always and continually prevail. Many people in our country continue to have a problem with valuing the contributions of Black people who have literally built this country 
on their backs and have not received proper recognition and or credit for it. It's time for that denial to stop. And so IBD has been focused on a number of important action items. The biggest priority has been raising money for our emergency fund, where we've been able to regrant dollars to individual artists and dance companies and related personnel in the field of dance who are members of the association. And the grants have ranged from $1,000 for individuals to $2,500 for arts organizations. And we have provided over 90 grants to assist with loss of income due to COVID-19 pandemic. Since IBD is virtual, we've also made the tough decision to postpone our upcoming 2021 conference and festival that was scheduled to take place in Toronto, Canada, and we've pushed it back to 2023. In addition, we recently received a grant from the Council of Library Information and Resources, also known as CLEAR, to establish what I call our Black Dance Archive. However, the project is officially named Preserving the Legacy and History of Black Dance in America. This will be the start of the IABD Dance Archives, and we are extremely excited to partner with Howard University's Moreland Spingarn Research Center. That is where IABD houses its its, uh, archives, and it's also fitting that the archive would live there and be a part of Howard University's uh, digital library space due to the fact that the first dance program at a historically Black college or university that offered a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree was from my alma mater, Howard University, HU. And it was led by uh, my mentor, Dr. Sherelle Berryman Johnson. May she continue to rest in peace. And so I was asked the question, what's bringing me inspiration right now? And right now, young people are giving me inspiration. Even though we're not able to gather together and dance together and be in person with one another, young people have taken this virtual moment in time to become even more creative uh, and innovative inside of our art form. I find it really, really fascinating. Though I will certainly say that I don't believe that we can sustain our field virtually forever. This is very difficult. It's uh, very challenging um, in terms of resources for many of our organizations to operate virtually. But to see young people really stepping out and using their art form in just extreme and beautiful ways has just been a pleasure to watch. And so they're taking dance to a whole nother level. Um, through all of the many social platforms that are online, they're bringing it to us. That's inspiring. What's also inspiring to me is actually having the ability to be at home. And I know most of you all are going, what? I travel a great deal. And so it's been nice to actually not have to travel and be at home and be with my family. With all that being said, I've been thinking a lot about what is next. What is the current state of operations for IABD? This just cannot be, it's not sustainable. Who is going to make it through the pandemic? Who are we able to help? How are we able to help them? How can we continue to be of service? How do I make my network work? How do I make my network work? Who can I ask for additional funding to help the community? But I do believe that folks within our dance community can can continue and must continue to support and lift one another up as much as we possibly can. There are so many of us right now who are doing all right, and there are so many of us who are not. Check in on people. Make sure that they're all right. Even if it's only just a quick hello or a short text or email or even voicemail. 
Sometimes people just need to know that you're thinking about them and that's all right. Just continue to be who you are. Be the best person you can be to yourself, to other people. And continue to have faith and believe that we will come back together again in person really soon. We need a vaccine first. But we'll be back together very soon. As Baba Chuck Davis would always say, peace, love, and respect to everyone. Take care, y'all. Thank you for all you do and all you have done, Ms. Saunders Thompson. Yes, thank you so much. Um, And please, we encourage you to visit iabdassociation.org to learn about all of the ongoing work that Denise and her colleagues are doing at IABD, about the I Said Can You Hear Me Now campaign, about the Black Report, about the IABD Emergency Fund. There's so much more that they're doing, as you heard. Um, We will include those links in the episode description. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news moving the dance world. And in the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Nina. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about the Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.